So I'd like to tell you about a 40-year journey to a type of medicine I think will take over in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And I call it P4 medicine, predictive, personalized, preventive, and participatory. To give you an idea of what this new medicine is, my prediction is each and every one of you will in 10 years have a virtual data cloud of billions of data points and will have the wherewithal to be able to reduce that enormous data dimensionality to simple hypotheses about health and disease. Now you can ask, why do you need this much information? Why does medicine need this much information? And the simple answer is because biology and disease are incredibly complicated. They're incredibly complicated because Darwinian evolution is a putter. It doesn't do things in direct ways. It's random and chaotic. And in fact, it's thinking about this kind of complexity uh, that promoted me at the beginning of my career, 1970 at Caltech, to start thinking about how we can decipher uh, complexity. And that led me, very fortunately, to participate in the ser series of paradigm changes, which fundamentally changed biology, the fifth of which was uh, P4 medicine. So one, we brought engineering to biology. We developed five instruments that have set the foundational framework of contemporary biology. One of them was the automated DNA sequencer that made the Human Genome Project possible. Second, I was one of the founders and, and executors of the Human Genome Project. And its enormous accomplishment was that it democratized genes. That is, it made all of our 20-some thousand genes accessible uh, to any biologist with the right kinds of tools. The third area was the realization, and this actually came from the automated sequencer, that biology had to change in a fundamental way by bringing in uh, computer scientists and engineers, uh, applied uh, physicists uh, and mathematicians because biology didn't need just to do biology, but it needed to invent the tools that would let us explore new dimensions of biology. The fourth change was this thing called systems biology. I'll talk in just a moment about what that's all about, but what it enabled was for biologists for the first time to really explore experimentally complexity in biology. And of course, the fifth P you've heard about uh, is uh, P4 medicine. So let me ask the simple question, how does systems biology go about deciphering complexity? And a simple analogy is, a, is, uh, is useful. I remember seeing a Rube Goldberg cartoon about 15 years ago where Rube Goldberg had actually attached 14 different gadgets together to be able to cool his soup. And so the interesting question is, if you just looked at this not knowing anything about it, what would you need to know to figure out how Rube Goldberg cooled his soup? Well, one, you'd need to know all the parts present in this circuit, if you will. You'd need to know how they are connected, and you'd need to know how they move, how the nature of their dynamics. That's all that systems biology is really about, except it also has very important insights into biological information. So for example, if we ask the simple question, what are the fundamental types of information in life? It turns out that there are only two. One is the information that's embedded in your genome, this digital language of life, four-letter code. The other is the environmental information that comes from the outside and impinges upon that digital information. And the two of those kinds of information together lead to the development of human organisms, their physiologic response to their environment, and indeed, they lead to the initiation and progression of disease. So the question you can ask is, what connects these two types of information with the phenotype, the appearance of the organism? And this is the key to systems biology. What connects them are biological networks that take this 
integrated information and then pass it off to molecular machines that are capable of executing the functions of life. So what systems biology is about is understanding the dynamics and the nature of networks and how they create, uh, in our case, uh, the disease phenotype. So what we can say then is if we're really interested in disease, the essence of disease is that in the organ the disease occurs, one or more of your biological networks has been disease perturbed genetically and or environmentally. It changes the information that expresses, and this information actually is what causes the disease. And indeed, we've spent an enormous amount of time, the last six or eight years, studying a simple neurodegenerative disease in mice, and we've demonstrated that indeed, you can analyze the information present in the brain and demonstrate that there are four major circuits that change in really interesting ways, and their changes explain virtually every aspect of this neurodegenerative disease that we know about. So this is a fundamental way of beginning to decipher complexity, but what it also led to is the deep insight that we can make the blood a window into health and disease. And that comes about as a consequence of each of your 50 or so major organs actually secrete proteins into the blood that are synthesized only in that organ, so they're organ-specific. And that means you have for each organ a fingerprint of proteins in the blood that will report back the status of that organ. So with that fingerprint, we can distinguish health from disease. And in fact, if you have a disease, we can determine which disease you have. Now, one of the real imperatives in this new medicine is that we explore completely new dimensions of patient data space. That means we have to develop new technologies. So let me tell you about two that will really transform your life and your health over the next 10 years. For example, we began about a year and a half ago determining the entire DNA sequence of members of families. And what was exciting about sequencing a whole family is one, because of the principles of genetics, we could correct almost all the sequencing errors, and two, we could really easily find disease genes. And that's going to be terribly important for the future. But even more, in your genome now, we know there are at least 105 genes, variants of which, if you have them, we can actually explain possibilities that will let you correct your potential for disease. There's a syndrome called Lynch syndrome. If you have a defect in that gene, that gives you a 80% chance of colon cancer by the time you're 50. If we know you have that gene, if you start doing colonoscopies at 25, then you can snip out the cancer and never get the disease. So these are the actionable genes that will drive the importance of the human genome. Another example is we're working on technologies where we hope in 10 years we'll have a handheld device that will prick your thumb, take a, a fraction of a droplet of blood, and we'll measure 50 organ-specific proteins from each of your 50 major organs, and we'll be able to follow longitudinally across your entire lifetime your wellness, as opposed to any transition into disease. If it occurs, we'll be able to remedy it very quickly. So this leads us to the four Ps then. So predictive. Well, my prediction, as you've heard, is in 10 years, you'll all have your genomes as a part of your medical record, will be able to inform you of all genes you have that are actionable. But more than that, for the first time, we'll be able to give you enormously specific advice about how to optimize wellness. So number two, you'll have this little handheld device. You'll prick your thumb and you'll, uh, twice a year, make these measurements and you'll follow your wellness across your entire lifetime, you'll be able to initiate a response to any transition into illness, into disease, uh, almost immediately. So the preventive has to do with the fact, one, these new approaches give us an entirely
entirely new approach to identifying drug targets, and they mean that in the future, the making of drugs will be enormously less expensive. Number two, we're going to actually solve the mysteries of the immune system so we can create the vaccines that will let us deal with uh, AIDS and malaria. But number three, the most important aspect of prevention is the focus increasingly in the future will be on wellness. And all of you are going to have to participate in this process of wellness, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. The personalized part of medicine arises from the fact each of you on average differs by six million letters of your DNA language from your neighbor. That means you're each unique. That means each of you is responsible for being the control for your transition from health to disease. The medicine of the past worked on population averages. The medicine of the future will focus on the individual. And of course, the participatory is the real challenge because it raises questions about how do we convince vision, uh, physicians that this revolution in medicine is something that they can adopt? How do we educate patients, not only as to the opportunities, but as to the challenges and responsibilities they have? How do we change the entire uh, medical care community? And most of all, how do we create an IT for healthcare that can deal with billions of data points in a really effective way. What people in IT are doing there today don't even begin to touch the dimensionality of the challenge that we'll be facing in the future. The essence of what P4 medicine is about is it is a network of networks. We have a network at the DNA level, at the molecular level, at the cellular level, at the uh, uh, tissue level, and finally at the individual level. And these networks can all be seamlessly integrated one to another. And what's almost certainly going to be true of these networks is their fractal in nature. That is, their structure at any of these dimensions of this network of networks is going to be very similar. What we learn about the molecular networks can be applied right out to uh, social networks and, and so forth. So the essence then of this P4 medicine is really two things. It's demystifying disease so we can deal with the uh, scourges of uh, humankind, but even more important, it's optimizing wellness. It's creating the metrics for each of you to be able to assess your wellness state and your slope toward or away from greater wellness and to get the information that will let you optimize uh, your own wellness and so forth. P4 medicine is really going to impact society. Number one, every single institution in the healthcare industry is going to have to rewrite its business plan in 10 years to adopt the new medicine. Number two, it is absolutely going to turn around the ever-escalating costs of healthcare and drop them to the point that we'll be able to export P4 medicine to the developing world. And this will lead to a democratization of healthcare inconceivable even five or 10 years ago. Number three, there'll be a digitalization of the information about us as individuals available real time so we can monitor and optimize wellness in ways we hadn't even conceived before. And number four, I think the nations that adopt P4 medicine will, will have opportunities for the generation of enormous wealth. One example is my prediction is within 15 years, there'll be a wellness industry that will exceed that of the healthcare industry, and it will be fueled by companies and strategies that are entirely different from those seen in the healthcare uh, industry today. So the really uh, fascinating question then is what is the central driving force of P4 medicine? It's going to be patients. It's going to be social networks. They're going to drive this medicine exactly as the AIDS activists drove the drug companies and the medical establishment to create the triple therapy for AIDS that converted AIDS from a fatal disease into a chronic disease. 
patients are going to be the real drivers. So how do we bring uh, P4 medicine? What are the challenges in bringing P4 medicine to society? They are two. One, the technical challenges, which I'm quite confident we can deal with. Two, the social challenges, the ethical, the regulatory, the legal kinds of questions. And here is where I think things will uh, clearly be slowed down. One point I'd like to make is I want to argue unequivocally that your data should be society's data so that accomplished people can analyze your data for the predictive medicine of the future, and that is to improve health care for your kids and your grandkids. If we don't adopt this policy, P4 medicine will be done in China, almost uh, uh, irreversibly argue that point of view. What ISB, my institute, has done to push the agenda of P4 medicine is to create strategic partnerships, and we have two major ones. One, a partnership with the country of Luxembourg, which brings to ISB $100 million over five years to invent the future, the fundamental strategies of P4 medicine. Number two, we've set up a relationship with Ohio State Medical School to bring P4 to Ohio State. And the idea there is to pick out key pilot projects and then to bring to those pilot projects one of the 18 or more assays, that is, uh, uh, study systems that ISB has developed for expanding our study of patient space in pilot projects that will demonstrate the power of P4 medicine. So with Ohio State, for example, the first project that we're really going to be pushing is a wellness project. Peace Health, a local community hospital in the Northwest, recently has joined the network. And in fact, we've created a nonprofit institute called the P4 Medicine Institute, whose major mission is twofold, to help ISB create a network of six to eight medical centers that will be doing the pilot projects. Once they're done, we'd love to take P4 medicine to a small nation like Luxembourg or uh, other nations that we're beginning to explore these issues with, because going to a nation that has a single payer system obviously is easier than dealing with the heterogeneous health healthcare system of the US. The P4 Medicine Institute is really interested in setting up a fellows program as well to attack the fundamental society prob societal problems of P4 medicine, and we invite any of you interested to come and speak to us about it. So let me close by making one point. As I began my career thinking about complexity, I now think about complexity in the 21st century as the major challenge for all scientific disciplines and engineering disciplines. And what I would argue is that biology uniquely has this systems approach that let us solve these problems of complexity. And why is that important? It's important because if we think about the most fundamental problems that society is facing today, healthcare, which we've talked about, uh, global medicine, agriculture, energy, uh, the environment, uh, agriculture, uh, nutrition, all of those can be attacked using exactly the same strategies we've talked about for healthcare. So the challenge for academic and industrial institutions in the future is how can you create this environment using the systems approach, cross-disciplinary, integrative, that will allow us to solve these major problems of society. And the question I'd leave you with is, are you going to be ready for P4 medicine? Are you going to be willing to take the responsibilities that you'll need to show in executing your own wellness program for the future? Thank you.